coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada, streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Float, Odyssey, Telegram, Twitch, TikTok, and the Prepper Broadcast Network. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim, and today is November 10th, 2022, and this is episode, are you ready for it? Big Old 200, episode 200 of the Workshop Podcast. Good to have you here, folks. It has been a great week. I haven't been live in seven days. <laughs> I wanted to see how long it would take you guys to figure out that I have a cold, but Chris Dixon figured it out pretty quick. Sinus infection always gets something at the very beginning of snow clearing season, but I got some straight Knob Creek right here. Going to help me make it through. Wasn't going to miss this episode for the life of me. Otherwise, I would have had to put Chris Dixon in charge tonight. Good to have you. We are over on TikTok right now. We got seven people in there. We're live on Prepper Broadcast Network, so let's get the announcements out of the way. All right, number one. PBN, Prepper Broadcast Network, has a deal on yearly membership right now. Ten bucks off. Use code PREPON and sign up at PrepperBroadcastingNetwork.com. And go over to the PBN website. I'll have the link in the description below. Use code PREPON. Save ten bucks. Number two, just before I went live tonight, Audible sent me a great link. If you are a Canadian existing subscriber... Sorry, guys, this is only for the Canucks right now. You can get a yearly plan for half price, 89 bucks for 12 credits. Half price for audiobooks. If you guys are like me, I live and breathe audiobooks lately. So check that out. Chris Dixon said he paired that with the three for a discount. He ended up getting 15 credits for half price. Can't go wrong with that. Who doesn't love cheap? audiobooks or less expensive because 15 bucks a pop is what it is. Number three, we officially have our first sponsor. My buddy Joel Riles from Fortress K9 is our first paid sponsor here. If you haven't checked him out yet, you need to check out his Protection Dog Podcast. Now you might say, wait a minute, I don't want to hear about dogs. Well, all I got to tell you is, yes, he trains dogs and it is awesome. But that is just one little bit of what Joel talks about. He will give you a verbal ass kicking. And if you come away from listening to his podcast and you're not motivated, then you probably don't have a heartbeat. So go by FortressK9.com. Follow my brother, my buddy Joel. Go and follow him on TikTok, on Instagram, and you will get your daily dose of inspiration and motivation. And I really wish I was in Texas right now hanging out with him because he was there today speaking at Jack's. D-Tango says the force is with you always over on TikTok. Good to have you. Check out the new shirt, guys. I know it's a little bit late for Halloween, but I had my eye on that, and it was so great to have that sent to me from uh, John and Amanda Willis from SOE Tactical. Check them out all the time. I got to plug them. They're always sending me these wonderful shirts. Today's tool, Grella Packing Tape. Oh, my God. I've been packing up a bunch of shit to send out lately, and with Christmas right around the corner, if you guys are looking for good tape to package shit that Canada Post probably can't wreck, check out Gorilla Packing Tape, because I love it. Comes with two rolls and a really cool dispenser for $10.79. Link is in the description. Okay, guys, here we are. Hey, LG, good to have you. So this episode, this series, has been long gestating in my brain. We'll take you back to last April, or well, this April, whatever you want to call it, eight months ago. I was getting ready to finish up my presentation or, or finish up the prep for my presentation for Nicole's spring workshop. Had a lot on my mind, and for whatever reason, I sat down, laid down in bed, and I always kill time reading something, watching videos, whatever, sometimes TikTok, bullshit, whatever. And so it just struck me and said, you know what? I got to look up when the first time the term prepper was used because we throw the word prepper around. We pretty much everybody in this community would recognize or self-identify. Hmm, oh, that's a scary term right there, guys. Would identify as the word prepper. And I thought, well, it, you know, you've heard a ton of people say, you know, pre-World War II, everybody was a prepper because that was just a lifestyle. We didn't use the word whatever. So it seems like one of those words that's probably been around since at least the 1950s. 
Well, I'm going to blow your mind in just a minute here, guys. But Terry says, hey, Tim, good good to have you over on uh, TikTok. She always helps me out at the local plum and shop. Great to have her. So let's go down an internet rabbit hole, guys. Back in the 80s and the 90s, there was a thing called Usenet. There was other names for it as well. But basically, it was like a bulletin board service where, because the internet didn't exist yet, geeks would call each other or I don't know if call is the right word. But, oh, Telegram stream is dead. I don't know what's going on over there, guys. I'm sorry. You'll have to come over here and see what's going on. I just, I don't get it. But, uh, yeah. So, anyway. Usenet. So, that was like a bulletin board service, basically where you would go back and you could phone in to other people's computers. You could leave something on a virtual bulletin board. You could interact, kind of like some of the early forums that were on the internet. And so, there was this whole, I don't just there, there was a ton of this information out there that was going to be lost. So anyway, somehow, love Google or hate Google, they purchased the rights or picked up all of the leftover Usenet archives from the 80s and the 90s. And they are a historical treasure trove of early electronic communications. Hey, Rachel Brand, good to have you. So if you're looking, look up Google Groups and you can go back and you can search terms in there right back to the early 1980s. So it's really neat to see trends. I went back and I was watching, uh, reading some of the late 99, late 90s, you know, some of the scares about Y2K. Anyway, so it's all there. It's it's pretty neat. So I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to pop in the word prepper and we're going to see when that became part of the popular vernacular. So I want to share something with you guys. And this is, I, okay, I'm going to toot my own horn. I'm going to guess this is the first time this was ever shared anywhere on the internet. So tonight we are going to get a little more technically advanced and I'm going to share my screen with you. We're going to watch a couple of quick videos. I know videos. I'm going to try to keep this as interesting as it can be, but I was pretty excited about this. So let's bring this up here, guys. Uh, right there. That should work. Okay. So I got to show you this. So if I asked you when the first time you ever heard the word prepper, when you thought it first came out, the earliest documented use online of the word prepper was May 22nd, 1999, less than a quarter of a century ago. So it seems to me like even if we thought it was a long time ago, now there were other words and we're going to go through them in other episodes, but this one was really cool. So I don't know if we can, I don't want to sc scroll through the whole thing, but uh, it's just a conversation. And of course, everybody whole idea of the preparedness movement, the word prepper spawned out of being prepared for Y2K. We all remember Y2K. And for some reason, I'm obsessed with Y2K. I don't have any of my patches here right now, but I just remember it. It was something I grew up. Hey, Letty Lou, good to have you. So right here, guys, this is the actual, and maybe I'm just a geek, but I really like, this is the inception. This seems to be where somebody made up or came up with the term prepper. And I thought this was pretty cool. So they, they go on and they said, I find it fascinating that so many of the things won't be so bad crowd. Thinking that those preparing for Y2K place sufficient stock in particular individuals, blah, blah, blah. You will find the pro prep people, pro prep, prep people. I love it. Sounds upbeat and op optimistic. Then somebody suggests, how about prep ciders? Kind of cool. Then they go here and they say, it's a comparable straw man to the planes flying out of the sky. And then the next line is the one that caught me. It said, you could, of course, say that the preppers are all lying. I don't think that is true, however. And that is where, in this conversation, somebody decided to come up with the term of prepper. And I have searched high and low on the internet for that word used in that term, in, in that specific term, and it doesn't exist. So it seems to me that on May 22nd, 1999, this dude called Joseph E. McIsaac came up with the term prepper. I thought that was pretty cool. Now, maybe that... It's just me geeking out, but I had to share it with you. So let's go back to full screen right here. Yes, Renegade Butcher says, let's all take a moment and be thankful that it turned out to be Y2K instead of y 2 not k <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I know what you mean there, buddy. <laughs> so anyway, I had to think that was pretty cool. And pre post-World War II, there was a ton of different terms. We're going to get into them, different episodes down the road. we got a big crowd in here tonight, guys. But 
the post-World War II world, try to say that a thousand or five times fast, really developed what the modern mindset of what a prepper or modern preparedness is. So I had to show that. That was just something I found. I'm probably going to turn this whole damn thing into a book series eventually, which would be kind of cool. Barrett, good to have my brother-in-law in here. Howdy. Martinson family, Letty Lou, Rachel, Renegade Butcher, Chuck. Hey, Chuck Peoples, good to have you. Good to have the whole crew in here tonight. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that part. So let's slide in, guys. So like I said, you've heard from a lot of people that prepping was just a way of life before World War II. In the past, everyone was a prepper. You wouldn't even use the term because that was just called common sense. If you didn't prep, you died. <laughs> Simple as that, right? We all love to say that everyone was a prepper in the past because if you didn't, you needed to have a pantry full of food. Everybody did, you know, whether they canned it, whether they dried it, whether they hung it, didn't matter. Everybody had to have a pantry full of food. You had to have a root cellar full of food. You harvested things when they grew because if you didn't, the stuff died and then you died. You looked after animals to feed yourself. If you didn't stock up and prepare for the future, you were like, what, the, the ants and the was it the ants and the bumblebees or whatever it happens to be. If you're not prepared, you died. You didn't make it through winter. If you didn't harvest food when it existed, you didn't make it through winter. You guys starting to sense a theme here? Because it's true. Common sense, everyday life, pre-World War II, and especially in the 1800s, was just a life of preparedness. You lived with the seasons, you stored food because you didn't know when the next time, well, you did know, but it wouldn't be till the next fall that the harvest would come in. So you had to save and you had to scrimp and you had to get by and you had to be prepared. It was just common sense. And then with the development of the modern society that we're going to deal with, that concept went right out the friggin' window. What do we got? Terry Boyscoat's motto, always be prepared. <laughs> Good to have you over there on TikTok, guys. All right. So I figured the first thing we're going to do is we're going to dig back through the, I was going to say centuries. Jesus, we're not going back that far, guys. Go back through the decades of the 1900s and see what kind of mindset, what kind of um, historical events shaped what modern preparedness is. And uh, we'll talk about World War One a little bit, World War Two. Chris Dixon says, a life of abundance killed all of that. And you are 100% correct, my friend. That, I think, truly was a big portion of it. So we'll go back through the roaring 20s, the dirty 30s, the start and the finish of World War II, and then we'll hop right in, guys. So first off, after World War I, this was something that uh, maybe some of you know, maybe you didn't, but the world went into a recession after World War I because they spent so much on the war. And then there was a Spanish flu that came right after that. It ended up cause, causing the GDP, the gross domestic product of the entire world to drop 8%. So almost 10% of the world's economy disappeared basically overnight due to the war and due to um, the Spanish flu or whatever you wanted to call it, right? So that was huge. And then all of a sudden, People pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and we had, or they had long before us, the first roaring 20s. And everybody was so goddamn excited. They thought it's always going to be this way. It was technological advances. There was economic advances. They pulled themselves out. They figured we're never going to have another war like the Great War. Everything's going to be good. Well, you guys know it didn't last, did it? There was this newfound optimism that things were always going to be that way, right? Because How's the stock market go in life in general? When things are good, they're always going to be good. And when they're bad, they're always going to be fucking bad, right? So you had cars, you had radio, you had uh, flight was just in its infancy. You had telephone, electricity, the beginning of the highway system. All of these things made it way, way easier for people to move from the country into urban centers. And what does urban not have? They don't have gardens, they don't have fields, they don't have livestock. You have to go to the grocery store to get your food. You're disconnected from the entire system, the entire way of life that always made people individually responsible for their own lives and preparedness. All of a sudden people said, well, we've got electricity. Well, we have a highway system. We have, well, maybe not quite just-in-time delivery for food yet, but that was when the disconnect really started when people said, well, I know where my food comes from. It comes from the grocery store, right? We all know that. <laughs> and they tried to they tried to 
follow that post-World War I optimism for as long as they could. And it was great. It was the Roaring Twenties. You know, we all see those pictures of the girls in the, I forget what they call them, the skirts, and they're dancing. And the Twenties just looked like a hell of a time. It seems so old now. But I mean, so many inventions came out of the Twenties. And then October 1929, anybody know what happened? I'm sure you do. Chris Dixon says, I love this saying. I'd only been recently introduced to it. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. Rinse and repeat. Sad but true. It is always, yeah, flappers. Thank you, Barrett. Flapper dresses, flappers. Yes, that's exactly it. And then October, I forget what they called it, Black Monday or whatever it was. And they had the stock market crash. Now, here's the thing. What did that bring on? The Great Depression. Again, hard times breed tough men, right? Tough people, tough women. But there was two things that happened right around that time. The first was the big crash of Wall Street and, you know, all of that economic growth that had come in the last decade completely fell apart just like that overnight. I, I don't, I didn't look up the numbers. Doesn't really matter. But the second part was the Dust Bowl. Now, here's the thing. A lot of times when these big events happen, you can point at one thing that started it all. But in this case, there was really two. And I dug into this. I didn't know this. Maybe you guys did. But of course, everybody knows about the stock market crash. And everybody just thinks the Dust Bowl happened because people stopped farming. Here's the thing. You could get 160 acres out west in land that was pretty good, but was hard to farm. So if you were a migrant, a migrant, not an <laughs> steady presence farm says I'm going to like this series. Ah, I love having, I love hearing that. So if you were a migrant, that's somebody moving, coming from England or Ireland or whatever, you could come in, come off the boat, and they would give you 160 acres of land. Now, during the time leading up to the late 20s and the early 30s, there was a lot of rain on the prairies and in the Midwest where everybody got all of this free land. It was cool. Here's the thing. It wasn't like that before. It wasn't like that after. So they used, I didn't know this, really poor farming techniques, which basically stripped the soil off the top of the land. And when it dried out, it all just blew away. It was absolutely crazy. So there was two things. You had a whole bunch of inexperienced farmers using shitty farming practices on land that couldn't sustain them. And then they got hit by a shitty stretch of weather. And that basically just tore them all apart. That's what created the Dust Bowl. And separately, you had the 1929 stock market crash. So those two things created the Great Depression. But what did Chris Dixon say up here? Hard times create strong men. So I went through and I grabbed some really neat, cool tips or things. So there were some things that people did in the Great Depression to make money. And I thought this was cool. Simple things. They caught and sold fish and shellfish. Chris Dixon says, sounds like Southern Alberta. That's exactly the type of land that everybody was heading to. If you guys saw that movie with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, my wife loves it. I can't think of it right now, where they're heading out west to stake some land. Great movie. That's the exact thing. They basically just, they're, they had like this, not an auction, but they said, you guys just head out and you put your flag on the land and it's your land. And these were people that had no clue what they were doing and they fucked up the land royally. Sorry, guys, I get real better to shape. But anyway, so they would catch fish, shellfish. A lot of this stuff reminds me of things that we still did on the East Coast, right? Far and away. Thank you, Nina or Nina. Barrett also said far and away. Yes, great movie. Uh, they picked and sold berries. They Some of them had multiple part-time jobs. They did yard work. Always work for a handyman, right? They made and sold quilts. Piecework sewing. Sewing was a great skill to have even in the 20s, the late 20s and the 30s. And then they sold homegrown produce. And then here's something else. My grandfather did this a bit too, but people traveled to where the work was. So the whole family would up and uproot and they would go in the woods and they'd live at uh, logging camps for years to get work done. They went where the work was because they had to. The women learned how to fix their own clothes. During heat waves, they would sleep outdoors. I know that blows our mind today, right? But um, people lived under their vehicles. So car camping was a thing even back then. Just crazy, right? Um, people paid bills with milk, eggs, and produce. Doesn't that sound like the modern day homesteaders? How we love to um, 
barter and trade and work on things like that. They would cut up old rubber tires and use them for the soles of their shoes. Had to get by for something. Multiple generations lived in a single home. Um, hunting and fishing fed their families. They made simple from scratch meals. All of this stuff is the preparedness mindset that was ingrained in people during the Great Depression. The seasons determined what you ate. When things were in season, you ate it. If they weren't, you didn't. There was no such thing as fresh strawberries in January or romaine lettuce anytime. <laughs> Jack of all trades could always find work. Now, here's the thing. I didn't know this either. As I was reading, leading into the early 30s, late 30s, all of that economic instability, check this out. It led or it helped give rise to the German and Japanese dictatorships. So because the whole world was falling apart economically, it encouraged people to feel desperate, look for help in crazy places. And so that's what gave rise to Hitler and whoever the Japanese leader was at the time, because they were looking for surety, um, you know, success. They were looking for answers anywhere they could. So bad people rose up. Now, here's the crazy thing that caused the war. And in a weird, broad sense, you guys have all heard this before, but the Second World War is a huge part of what caused the worldwide economy to be, to come out of the Depression. So the Depression brought on hard times. Bad men rose to power. They had a war to fight those bad men. And that damn war helped bring the economy out of a Depression. I don't know. It blows me away. That That is the free market economy 100 times over. So when the war started, you had a ton of people join up and start into these military and defense jobs. As World War II stretched on, you guys ever heard of the Manhattan Project? It was in full swing. That, If you haven't heard of the Manhattan Project, that was the Americans rushing to develop nuclear weapons. Tons and tons. I think I read somewhere it was 150 to 200,000 people employed just in the Manhattan Project. So the U.S. becomes the first country with nukes. Pretty crazy, I know. But... They get to the end of the war, you know, basically the U.S. Hey, Texas, uh, Tennessee Texan Shiner says, nice shirt, good to have you. So, you know, the uh, the U.S. and the Allies are coming one direction, the Russians are coming another. They meet in Germany and they split up and they both become worldwide powers. Now for about five years, the U.S. is the only place to have nuclear weapons. That's going to play a part in what we talk about here in a few minutes. Now, post-World War II, this is where everything accelerated. This is where the move from rural to urban lifestyle and all of the benefits, but the non-preparedness drawbacks slide in here. So coming out of World War II, 7 million veterans used their GI Bill to go to university. So all of a sudden you have a ton of guys who before the war were working with their hands, were working blue collar jobs. They went to university and got non-blue collar jobs. So you took six to seven million, you know, guys who were used to working with their hands, you took them out of that and you put them into, say, office jobs, white collar work, higher up stuff, which was great for the collective intelligence and the economy. But you took all these people, again, where are these jobs? They're in the cities. You took them out of the country. Just one of those things. So they moved from a self-sufficient agricultural based uh, economy, lifestyle, into a modern urban society. Good or bad doesn't matter, but this was the trend that pushed people away from being self-prepared. So all of a sudden you had this interconnected urban society, and it was it was basically a runaway train. You guys remember that song from, uh, um, oh shoot, I can't think of the name of the band right now. Soul Asylum, runaway train, little different song, but everything, it was basically a runaway train at this point because you had all of these trends, Pre-World War One, World War II, people were already starting to move toward the urban kind of development. And then you had all these people coming out with the GI Bill, getting a bunch of money, which was great. You know, they were looking after their veterans and they're like, hey, I'm going to go to school. So then they get these really good jobs. <laughs> Steady presence says ACDC. And then so it just accelerated the move from the country to urban centers. It was what it was. In 1920, 
32 million Americans were involved in farming, or 30% of the population. By 1981, 3% of the population. So, yeah, you do the math. Now, here's the thing. Until 1949, so from 1945, the end of World War II, to 1949, people were fairly optimistic because we won the war, we had the bomb, and we were the victors. There wasn't a whole lot of nuclear anxiety right at the moment. I mean, I'm sure there was if you lived in Japan, right? But nobody really, everybody was kind of riding that post-war high. The economy was booming. And then here's the thing. So as I was researching this, I tried to pick a date that modern preparedness was birthed. So we'll call it a birth man, a birth, birth man, what the hell's wrong with me? A birth date of prepping. Okay. I couldn't do it. I picked two dates instead. So here's the first one. Thank you very much. Renegade, he says, this is a good history class. Tim, the teacher man. I know if you can't tell, I'm kind of passionate about history. It's weird that way. So two birth dates of modern prepping. Okay. Here's the first one. I'm going to give it to you. August 29th, 1949. And I'm, there's no reason you should know what this date was, but that is the day that the Russians dropped what the U.S. called Joe One. It was the very first nuclear bomb that Russia had developed. It was a complete 100% direct copy of the Fat Man bomb that the Americans dropped on Nagasaki. That is the, I would say, the day that the Cold War really started. That's the day that nuclear anxiety or atomic anxiety started. That's the day that people realized, holy shit, things could be bad. So that's the first date. That's the day that all of a sudden, all of North American society walked around with a cloud of anxiety over their head. They lived in fear for quite some time. That's the first date. Date number two, January 12th, 1951. That was the day that the Federal Civil Defense Administration was established as an independent agency. So that was, of course, it always takes a couple of years for government to catch up to you, right? So August 29th, 49 was when the Russians tested their first bomb. That's when they became a nuclear superpower. And so about a year and a half later, the American government launched the Civil Defense Agency. And that is what promoted bottom-up preparedness in North America. It was two things. It was a response to the Russians having the bomb, but it was also a need for modern society because here's the thing. If we lived, if we still lived in spread out rural communities, needing to have civil defense wouldn't have been nearly as important because you didn't have all of these people completely centered into these really tight urban areas. So civil defense was launched. So those to me are the two birth dates of modern prepping. Uh, hey, Tim, Tim Galwick, never seen you in here before. Always the government. He said, <laughs> yep, steady presence says that's my anniversary. So those to me are the two birth dates. Now, for some reason, I've always kind of geeked out a little bit on civil defense. And if you guys don't know what civil defense is, it was the government organization that basically sought out to prepare American society for the eventualities of a nuclear attack and other um, weather-related emergencies, that kind of thing. When Nat was on the other night, the preparedness guy, he works in that kind of thing. And so he, he's he's a big geek into civil defense as well. And I just think the, the retro CD civil defense logo is so cool. When I was out visiting, uh, when we went to Nicole's last April, there was still an old-fashioned civil defense sign there. Uh, heading out toward her place at, uh, I think it was a church or a community hall or something like that. So I've always been intrigued by it. Of course, it was before my time. It was before my dad's time even. Uh, well, some of it. He, he grew up through it. But uh, to me, civil defense, when it launched, you can look at... <laughs> Nina says, do you know this much about Canadian history? This is awesome. So <laughs> Canadian history is kind of boring. Um, it I just look at uh, American history and I say, really, however America goes, Canada goes as well. So it's just as easy to talk about American history. 
So we had the civil defense movement. This is what launched. This is what, the, to me, you can look at everything civil defense did and you can take every one of those principles and you can turn them into a modern preparedness principle. I think it's really cool. We're going to actually watch a couple of old videos on it uh, tonight. Anyway, whatever, right? So it was founded for Americans to, or, well, you know, there, there was a Canadian one. Uh, Britain founded a civil defense league as well. And I think Britain actually founded it before the U.S., probably because of the uh, constant bombing that they had to go through. But uh, civil defense itself was a government organization. You know how I feel about government. But I honestly would say, <laughs> and of course, government always finds ways to screw everything up. And they discovered that by buying metric tons of hard pack crackers and just storing them in an underground bunker is not prudent. And so some of the ways they do things nowadays are a little bit better, right? Either way, civil defense, I kind of dug it. So the first thing civil defense did was education. And they had a ton of films. Uh, when I was at prepper camp, Dave Jones, the nuclear biological chemical guy there, he was talking about the, uh, so there was all these, I don't want to call them propaganda films, but they were instructional educational films that civil defense put out. You guys ever heard of duck and cover? I think that was a, maybe they, they spoofed that in South park, I believe. Anyway. So Dave Jones was like, yeah, they used to use big name American actors. He said, I even remember seeing one on TV that had Gene Hackman in it. And some young millennials like who the hell is Gene Hackman? And I had to laugh. So anyway, so they did a lot of these videos and you guys have probably seen them before. They're kind of cool. Um, interesting, rather, uh, they're, they're definitely dated at this point, that's for sure. But, uh, so the very first one that they put together was for kids because they wanted to introduce them to the idea of there being, uh, how do you want to put it? Uh, I guess they just, they knew the whole idea of a nuclear war existed. So they wanted to desensitize the poor kids to it. So let's go back right to there, guys. So first off, this one was called Duck and Cover. I'm going to see if I can bring it up for you. Hang on. Bring it up. We'll bring me down here. So you should be able to hear this on the recording if you're doing, um, if you're audio only as well. But this is uh, a little, um, I, I don't even know the guy's name, but he was a little animated turtle. This was one of the very first videos. We're going to watch 30 seconds of it. Bert the Turtle. This is the way he keeps from being hurt. Sometimes it even saves his life. Now, you and I don't have shells to crawl into like Bert the Turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck with your face. Duck and cover underneath a table or desk or anything else close by. In Betty's school, there isn't that crazy, guys? So that's what they were teaching in schools, duck and cover. Now, I should be able to get away with playing these videos because they're old enough that they should be public domain. I hope I don't get a copyright strike. I should be good on this, but they're pretty interesting. So this was one they had for kids. And for every video they put out, they put out um, documentation as well. So I printed out some of these. I always wanted to have them anyway, but this one here, if you guys can see it, was called Fallout Protection. Uh, what to what to know and do about nuclear attacks. This was one they put out. And another one they put out was survival under atomic attack. So they put all this kind of stuff out. The government funded it because everybody was scared shitless of the idea of a nuclear attack. Rightfully so. But it was, like I said, this one was called duck and cover. And we all laugh and we're like, oh, what in the hell is duck and cover going to do if there's an atomic bomb? But they had to teach them something. And this was where they started. So then they put out some more adult kind of films, not those type of adult films, but you know, uh, yeah. So LG says in elementary school, I remember we had to do duck and cover drills and oh, Letty Lou. See, we never did these at all. Uh, Letty Lou says we did duck and cover for tornado drills in elementary school. Now, hey, Joseph Mills. I see him over on uh, TikTok tonight. Good to have you, brother. Uh, and uh, Martinson family says I watched that on reels in junior high. Okay. I don't know if anybody else is old enough to remember this, but I certainly do when the teacher would be like, hey, we're having a movie day and they would bring in the old reel to reel projectors. Yeah, I love those. <laughs> but yeah, so this is the type of stuff that they put out and they're, they're kind of cool. There's something about 
the nostalgia factor. I mean, a lot of it is um, new, not new, but it, there's a renewed interest in the whole nuclear thing because of Ukraine and Russia and all that. But this stuff was really cool. This was this was the mindset of the new urban society that was like, well, what do we do if a bomb gets dropped on a city? Where do we go? What do we do? So then they put together some other stuff. Another one was called Survival Under Atomic Attack. Then it was a book that gave Americans information on how to prepare themselves for a nuclear attack. That's this one right here, guys. We'll bring this one up and we'll show you right here. See if we can play that. Without space, without panic, the reality of our times, the fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities. And let us prepare for survival by understanding the weapon that threatens us. An atom bomb destroys or injures in three ways, by blast, heat, and radioactivity. The blast of an atom bomb is its most important destructive agent. In Japan, whole buildings were flattened by its force. However, many buildings of sturdy construction, even though close to the explosion, remain standing. So there we are. That So that was another one. And like Chris Dixon says, we didn't learn any of this in Western Canada. We didn't watch this in school either. But a lot of this predates a lot of us too. But these were, this was another, another piece of, so this, this was the atomic anxiety that was hanging over everybody's head. People were scared to death at the end of the world. You had prophets in churches saying the world's coming in. Jesus is coming back. Heaven help us all. We're all hooped and screwed and whatever. And then all of this was coming out. And I think the idea behind this was not to desensitize people, but to at least open them up to the idea that this is a reality. It really sucks that it had to be, but the idea behind civil defense was a bottom-up preparedness mindset. So building shelters, stocking first aid, stocking food, all the stuff that us as preppers do, and the rest of uh, the rest of the world thinks, ah, whatever, we'll let the government come in and take care of us. So this was the type of stuff that the baby boomers grew up on. Uh, and then there was a program at this time, this was in, I think, 1956, something like that. It was called Alert America. And I mean, this was, uh, again, I hate to use the word propaganda, but propaganda has positive and negative effects. But it was a convoy of tractor trailers that went around the country. They traveled 36,000 miles, 82 major cities, attracted over a million people. And what they would do is they would show up, the sides would come down off the trucks, and they would have entire displays of how to survive nuclear attacks. They would have, you know, gas masks, Geiger counters, um, individual uh, designs for bomb shelters, all of that kind of stuff. So it was basically a traveling convoy that went around the United States, sharing with people the knowledge that they needed to hopefully survive a nuclear attack. So that was the first thing, education. And of course, that's always a big portion of it. Now, the next thing, I mean, as preppers, that's what we do. We learn, right? We, we either read, we watch, or we do. And when we do all of that, we're learning. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Freaking crazy idea. But that's, that's the big mindset of preppers is always improving, always learning our skills. And yeah, Kentucky Sustainable Living says that convoy would have been really cool to see. I couldn't find any footage of it. I, I didn't look that hard, but it would be really neat to see. So the first thing, that's the prepper mindset, and this is where it came from with civil defense, was teaching people the things that needed to be taught. LG called it a traveling survival circus. Um, so then the next part was evacuation plans. Now, if you are, when I was down in Florida this year, you could see um, signs for hurricane evacuation routes, and they were developed back in the 50s from civil defense plans because they put together evacuation routes. Now, they knew, 100% knew, that if a bomb was dropped directly on a major city, there wasn't nobody in that city evacuating. But the plan was, if and, and all of this came from the mindset that a plane had to leave Russia, fly to North America, and drop a bomb. And if they did that, you knew hours ahead of time so they could evacuate cities. So they put together evacuation routes. What do we call that? Bug out plans, bug out routes, all of that. So this whole mindset of getting out of Dodge if the shit literally and figuratively hits the fan was another thing that civil defense was absolutely pushing on the people at the time. 
Renegade says, loving the tour of the modern mindset, but I would argue that humans have been prepping since the beginning of agricultural and perhaps beginning with making jerky before that. Absolutely. Here, here's the thing. And, and that's what I touched on early on. We've always said pre-World War II, prepping, we didn't, we, you didn't call it anything. It was just called life. It was called, if you don't harvest in the fall, you die in the winter. You know, if, if you don't put food underground for the, the lean times, you don't make it through, period. Simple as that. The, the, w I guess what I'm saying is the modern prepper mindset developed because of urbanization and because of the disconnect from living off the land. And that's why before that, it, there wasn't a need for it because people knew, holy shit, if I don't go out there and cut that wheat down, once it snows, I'm hooped. I don't have bread all winter and I'm not going to get to eat. And uh, <laughs> Steady Presence Farm says back in the days where tricking, chicken tractors on meth weren't a thing. Also very, very true. Now, another big portion of civil defense was building fallout shelters. Now, we always called them bomb shelters. I did. Learned something new. They didn't talk about building a bomb shelter. They weren't telling people to build shelters that would survive a nuclear blast because that wasn't a thing. They were concerned about radiation shelters because if you were in that 5 to 10 mile radius of the bomb, you probably weren't going to survive anyway. But radiation was the silent killer later on. And uh, Dave Jones sent me a video a few months ago. I didn't bring that one in tonight. But it was just this, this guy in a suit and tie. No, not a suit and tie, but a, a shirt and a tie and dress pants because in the 50s, every man did everything like that. And he's in his basement building a bomb shelter out of cinder blocks. And he's doing all of the masonry work and doesn't get a spot on his tie or his shirt or anything. So the whole idea was they wanted somewhere people could shelter in place to wait out the radiation because the half-life of radiation, about seven days and, you know, it's much safer than what it could have been. So they were, uh, JFK was looking at implementing shelters in a whole bunch of urban environments. It was basically either underground or in the center. It didn't have to be the lowest point, just the center of apartment buildings. And of course they were uh, imploring and hopefully empowering as many people as they could to do this for themselves. So it was take a corner in the basement and build cinder block walls, fill those walls full of sand. And you didn't even have to have a door on it. You just had to have two right-hand turns because radiation can't go around a corner. I thought that was kind of neat. So if you had an opening and then you made a right-hand turn, it's just like sound. It basically blocked almost all of it out. So you didn't actually have to have a door. The idea was, again, preparedness. So I kind of look at radiation shelters as a bug out location, somewhere you could go to escape the craziness. And this was the mindset because in the 50s, everybody was just scared of nuclear war. Now it could be a hundred different things you're prepping for, right? And then, you know, I couldn't, uh, we couldn't talk about this without talking about communications. And you guys growing up, you probably all remember the emergency response system. And they'd always be, this is a test. And if the following wasn't a test, it would be followed by a message from some stuff suit telling you where to go and how to get there. But before the emergency broadcasting system, they had what they called Conelrad, C-O-N-E-L-R-A-D. And if you look at old radios from the 50s and the 60s, they actually had two marks on the AM dial that showed you exactly where you could turn for what was basically the emergency broadcasting system called Conelrad. So check this out. It's a one minute video. It explains exactly what it stood for, what they did. And it was, like I said, a precursor to the modern emergency broadcasting system. So let's bring this up. Also, guys, if you're on the live stream over on Prepper Broadcast Network, you can't hear the audio to these videos. It will be uploaded afterwards. Colonel Rad, our emergency broadcasting system is designed to give life-saving instructions and information without giving enemy bombers signals that could guide them to targets in the United States. Should the United States be attacked, warning would go out through Air Force and Civil Defense channels. All radio and TV stations would go off the air. In a matter of minutes, Conrad radio stations would return on the frequencies of 640 or 1240 to broadcast life-saving instructions and information. Only Conrad 
at 6.40 or 12.40 on your standard radio, will bring you vital information from community, state, and national officials. In case of enemy attack, tune to 6.40 or 12.40 on your radio. Colonel Rad. So there you go, guys. I that I love that old comms thing. So that was another part of civil defense. And uh, so there, that's the old civil defense logo. It's blue and white, though. Looks really cool. I would love to get a hold of an actual vintage um, civil defense sign to have. I'm going to eventually do some kind of cool backdrop. But anyway, just really, really neat. So that 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 was Conrad. That was the emergency broadcasting system before the emergency broadcasting system existed. Don't I love learning this old shit? It's so cool. So like I said, all the old radios had 640 and 1240 marked on them. And so this is how it happened. They basically uh, shut everything else down. All radio and television stations would shut down. And they would use local transmissions to let people know what the hell is going on. And so then, of course, it eventually morphed into the emergency broadcasting system. So it was kind of cool. Now, um, as far as, so basically when you would take this, there was um, the comms involved in it. Now, I had to, I don't know if Nate's still in here or not, but I couldn't leave out my brother Nate and his love for ham radio. So back in the late 40s, early 50s, ham radio was still a thing and comms were totally a thing. And just hang on here. So I wanted to read this to you again. Um, so in the 1950s, of course, when there was a huge threat of nuclear attack, the guys, the um, hams or the ham radio guys were constantly listening to the radio. Hey, Nate. So this was kind of cool. Check this out. So in the 50s, they were listening to the sky constantly to see, hey, is anything coming? October 4th, 1957, ham radio operators in the eastern United States heard a beeping sound on a lower frequency that had never existed before. That is how the United States discovered that the Soviets had put the Sputnik satellite into orbit. Ham radio people monitoring the airwaves looking for possible attacks discovered a beeping in the sky in 1957, and that was the very first artificial satellite put into space. They didn't announce it. The United States didn't know, and... There you go. How crazy is that? So, of course, comms, right? Whether it was ham radio or the Conrad, which was the precursor to emergency broadcasting. Letty Lou says Wikipedia says it was phased out in 1963. And now, of course, they have the ones that they send out through your cell phones and all of that. But I just, I thought that was really, really neat. Uh, when it came to food and water, civil defense teachings were very, very basic. They basically said you need to have food to survive for seven days. And when they said food, they basically just meant bare calories. So there was two things that they basically stocked in almost all shelters. One was big, heavy metal cans full of hard candy, just straight up calories. And the other were these bricks of hard pack crackers, like hard tack, basically what the British would eat. I think you would just soften them up with water or whatever. It was basically carbs and calories. And that's what they had. And it was basically just enough to keep you alive. You'd be friggin' miserable, but that was the type of thing. Have food on hand so you don't die when you have to shelter in place, right? I thought it was really cool. Um, Nate says, yep, hams were also banned from operations during World War II. Equipment was confiscated and hams would often show up to help with comm stateside and will be working with their old radios. I did not know that. That's really cool. Maybe we'll have to do a whole episode on the history of ham radio as well. Um, but yeah, so civil defense, this was an entire movement. It was, of course, a government organization, love it or hate it. But they evacuation, communication, uh, education, and food and water, shelter, all of that. And what does that sound like? The modern prepper, right? So, um, you know, if, if, if or when we're going to be bugging in or bugging out, the whole idea of what civil defense taught really moves into modern preparedness. And it moves us into the whole idea of, holy shit, these type of things, I am responsible. That was the crazy thing about civil defense. And that's what's different from civil defense in the 50s to modern emergency management today. 
and I get it. Emergency management today is run top down. It's run like a business. You know, they have, um, what do you want to call it? Like uh, memorandums of understanding. That's the word I'm looking for with big suppliers. So you have Walmart, you have Lowe's, you have Home Depot, all of those people that are going to supply and you're going to come in and you're going to go to the urban centers and you're going to take care of people. Whereas civil defense was the individual was responsible for their own preparedness. So, and that, and that's where that prepper mindset came from because we know <laughs> that I'm from the government and I'm here to help is bullshit, unfortunately. Simple as that. So the whole individual modern preparedness mindset spawns out of the 1950s teachings of civil defense. I think it's really cool. So I don't know. I, this To me, this whole series is just going to be so much fun. I have been attempting to collect some vintage preparedness books. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of where this series is going over the next little while. Hopefully about once a month. There's a lot of work goes into these episodes. I know it's crazy, but it, there is. So we're going to do a decade at a time. We're going to, you know, we just did the fifties, then we're going to do the sixties, which uh, in the sixties, preppers were called retreaters. Didn't know this. You can probably figure out why, but uh, so you had sixties were the retreaters, seventies were the survivalists, eighties were the 80s and 90s. Uh, anyway, I don't want to, you know, shoot it all down right there. But basically, we're going to work our way through. And each decade, there was modern thinkers that were kind of at the spearhead of modern preparedness in each decade. So in the 60s, the retreater movement was by a guy named Don Stevens. I managed to find his old book on some ancient website. And then in the 70s, there was a ton of survival and prepping newsletters. I'm starting to collect up some of those. It is going to be, I'm excited. And one reason I do this series, uh, I sometimes when I get into these series and my mind gets going with them, I use them to write a book as well, or the idea behind writing a book eventually. This will be the third one that I started to put together. But I'm going to use this as possibly genesis to, to building a, a manuscript for, for a book down the road. Anyway, so I've got some of these. There, If you guys have ever heard of Mel Tappan, there's a really famous prepping book called Mel Tappan on Guns. Well, he started a, I think it was called the Survival Letters, and it was a newsletter that went out every month, and they're really hard to come by, but I just found some on an old forum online. I managed, I had to sign up for the forum, and it took a while to get approved, but I just downloaded the zip files tonight, and then there's another, <laughs> uh, Letty Lou says, I'd pay good money for this knowledge, Tim. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's just one of my passions for some weird reason. And then there's another set of newsletters. I can't remember the name of them right now, but I just found them at a bookstore in, of all places, uh, St. Albert, Alberta. There's four of them. <laughs> they're not cheap, but they're in vintage brand new shape. So I'm going to pick those up and we're going to work our way through the decades of modern preparedness. This is something I don't think anyone anywhere has ever put together at this um, concept or this level. There is a couple of small just kind of brief books on the whole idea of the uh, history of preparedness. But to me, this is, we're going to go above and beyond. So who knows how many episodes it will take, but for sure we're going to do one on 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then 2000s, 2000s, 10s, whatever. Yeah. I'm excited. I hope you guys love going down this rabbit hole with me. And yeah. Oh, we made it through 53 and a half, almost 54 minutes, guys. And thanks to my beautiful Knob Creek Wicks whiskey, it managed to uh, keep my voice together. So I apologize for uh, my raspiness, but I'm impressed that it held up as well as it did. So we're going to have a pre-recorded episode going out tomorrow. That'll uh, be an On the Roads Ramblings I recorded today while I was driving. So for the foreseeable future, there's going to be four episodes a week. As you can tell, I'm probably heading toward five eventually. We're going to do, for the time being, three live streams, as always, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. And we're going to do a pre-recorded episode on Fridays. So it'll be something that I record on the road at some point. I've got a backlog of pre-recorded episodes. It's going to be a lot of fun. We had a great crowd in here. I think I saw us top out at 22 or 23 live stream participants, guys. So thank you. 
share this series with everyone. I want you guys to spam it out on social media everywhere if you can, because this is going to be a hell of a ride and it is going to be a lot of fun. Maybe I'll end up having to teach some sort of course on, I don't, whatever, it doesn't matter. But it, to me, it's exciting. It's new. It's something fun that I think everybody's going to be really excited about. Look forward to it about once a month. I won't promise it'll be once a month. It's going to be kind of like my empty container series. And also, we're going to have one of those coming up right away on IBC totes because you guys love them so much. What did we do before? Five-gallon buckets and milk crates. The next one's going to be IBC totes. That's coming up. And now that I am i didn't end up going to Jack's and all of my speaking and traveling engagements are over with and we're fully into winter snow removal season, I got a hell of a time to commit to some kick-ass motherfucking content, guys. I am excited. So, yeah, if you don't love F-bombs, I don't know what to tell you because when I get excited, I cuss. It is what it is. So that's it for me this week, guys. I really, really, I blue barrels. Yes, blue barrels as well. I got so much stuff on the go, guys. For a minute, I read that as something different, Mr. Dixon. So that's it for me. Like I said, please, when this episode comes out on audio, it'll be live here in about a half an hour. Take a minute. Uh, Nate just sent me uh, military frequencies over on Telegram. Said uh, He just sent me a website that said, uh, military frequencies, number stations, odds and ends, gives times and samples of live audio clips. Very cool. Thanks, Nina. Thanks, everybody, for dropping in. And as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.